Well, it's gloomy outside, but it's a great day inside. Praise the Lord. Don't you agree? Let's stand and worship together. He reigns. Good to have you here this morning, and we're excited to have a wonderful day to worship together and to enjoy the best place to be when it's raining like this outside, and that's inside. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into this nice, warm, dry place and to worship you. And I pray today, Lord, as we come into this place, that you would meet us here, that you would send your presence to settle on this place like a cloud, and we would Leave this place undeniably knowing that we have been in the presence of God. I pray that you will direct everything that takes place and that it will all draw us closer and closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. 
Well, we've got a number of announcements today. Uh, first one is our alabaster offering. Uh, for the next couple of weeks, we'll be taking our alabaster offering, and you see the, the little church out in the foyer. Um, the alabaster offering is funds that the Nazarene Church raises, and this is something we do twice a year in February and September. And these funds go to build church buildings, hospital buildings, uh, missionary homes, missionary clinics around the world. Um, and we have raised, I think it was $48 million, I think was the number, since 1948. Uh, it's a crazy amount of money that has been raised and been used for, for years to do awesome things. So uh, if you want to drop a, an offering in the alabaster box on your way out today, that'll be awesome. Um, and I think there are extra alabaster boxes out there if you need them. So we encourage you to collect your change, and we'll turn that in twice a year. Uh, bills are always accepted. As our checks. Um, 30 hour famine is coming up. The youth group will be doing the 30 hour famine uh, February 22nd and 23rd. Uh, if you're interested in, in helping with that, there's a couple ways that you can help. First of all is through sponsoring this. The reason we do the 30 hour famine is to bring awareness to the reality of hunger around the world. Um, but also to raise funds to help fix that hunger problem around the world. So if you would like to sponsor a child, then there's a sign up sheet in the, in the foyer for that. Also, uh, uh, juice is needed for that as well. The kids go without food for 30 hours, but they do have juice, but we don't want really acidic juice for them. Uh, that doesn't set well when there's no food on the stomach, so details on that in the bulletin as well. Um, crisis care kits, we're still collecting those. Uh, the details on that in the bulletin as well. Uh, the crisis care kits are staged in various places around the U.S. so that when a crisis hits, we can get the kits into the hands of those who need them. Um, it's just the essentials. What do you need when you have nothing? If you lose your house, what do you need? So soap, shampoo, towels, um, just basic basic needs. So those are in the foyer as well. Um, the last call for the adult Valentine's banquet. This uh, coming Saturday, we're going to have our Valentine's banquet here at the church. Cost will be $10 a person, and uh, ch- child care is available for that. Um, sign up in the foyer today if you want to dedicate a song. And then Janice Cahill has tickets, and it's going to be a great meal. Uh, we're going to have uh, barbecued ribs, I think, is going to be the, on the menu again, so it's going to be a great meal. And it's a fundraiser for the teens as well. So I encourage you to, uh, to enjoy that time. Um, New church directories are available in the foyer if you want to grab one of those, one per family. And then uh, a baptism class is going to be offered on Sunday, February 24th, and we'll do that right after church on that Sunday, and we'll talk about what baptism is, and then we'll get a baptism scheduled from that time. And then uh, Saturday, February 23rd, from 3 to 5 in the church gym, we're going to have a special birthday party for someone. Someone's turning 90 years old this month, so we're going to have a... Special birthday for, uh, for Harriet uh, Mooney. All right. <laughs> and then uh, next Sunday is also going to be a special Sunday. We're going to have uh, Dr. Gary Miller here. Uh, it's going to be my two-year review. Um, I've been at this church for two years now, so he'll be here. He'll preach next Sunday. He's going to preach on the engaged readings that we're doing. And then after that, we're going to have a board meeting. And board members, he said it would probably take about 20 minutes. So it won't be a long board meeting, so we'll just do that immediately after the service, and then you can go and have, uh, have go on with your afternoon plans. And then the last announcement, um, just a, a reminder for you, we did have to cancel services a couple of weeks ago, and that did have a significant impact on our finances. Um, our church finances, we typically bring in around twelve to $13,000 a month to meet the bills that we have. And uh, in January, because of missing that last Sunday, we brought in around 6000 So we were around 6000 short. So if it's possible to catch up on that or to, uh, to help in any way with that, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, it does cost a lot for us to have this building and to be able to worship here. Um, our heat bill this month, just so you know, is $1,500. And so that, uh, that is due this week. So if, it's able, if you're able to help with that, um, then we would greatly appreciate that as we take our tithes and offerings later this morning. So let's uh, continue on our time of worship and stand together as we sing Everlasting God.
when we come together each week, we come together with all the lives that we've been living over the past weeks. We come in with the burdens, we come in with the concerns, and unfortunately those don't just melt away at the door. But if they did, that wouldn't solve anything, would it? You have to go back out into that world, you have to go back into those burdens. And this time in our service is a time where we bring those burdens to the one who can actually do something about them. So I encourage you this morning to take advantage of this time of prayer. If you would like to come forward, our altars are open. You can remain standing, you may be seated, whatever is the least distracting for you as we focus our attention on and bring our needs to the one who can help. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have the opportunity to come into this place and to bring before you the concerns that weigh so heavily upon us. Father, we're thankful for the fact that you hear us when we cry out to you, whether we're here or whether we're alone in our car or alone in, in our homes, you hear us when we cry out. And you may not always respond in the way that we want you to, or in the timing that you want us to, or we want you to, but you are responding, and you are working for our best, and for the best for your kingdom. But Father, thank you that even when it's not time yet, you still listen to our cries. Thank you, even when we've made mistakes, you still hear us when we pray. Thank you for allowing us to come before you and for telling us to come boldly before the throne of grace with confidence. Father, as we come together today, we come with all of our concerns, all of our lives, all the stuff that's going on in our, our personal lives, our families, our finances, our world. And we bring these and we lay them at your feet. We take time now to silently lift up those concerns that are weighing heavily upon us. Father, thank you that you hear us when we pray. We do lift up the concerns that have been brought before us this morning. We pray for Jody McGaffey, who is uh, in the hospital in Omaha with uh, some con serious conditions, and just pray that you'll be with Jody and be with uh, Pastor Dave this morning and be with him in a very, very special way. Father, may they sense and know your presence in this time, and, and may you just supply every need that they have. Father, we pray for uh, Mike Baker, who is a friend of the Potter family and starting radiation treatments for his cancer. And Father, we just pray that you would be very, very close to Mike during this time. Father, we know that there are a multitude of other requests that, uh, that weigh heavily on us. We know that there are a number of concerns that, that we hold dear, and we lift those up silently this morning. But Father, we pray for those who are struggling with their personal finances. And we ask, Lord, that you would provide the, the needs, and we are reminded that you teach us to pray give us our daily bread not give us a six month supply but I pray that you would give the daily bread for those who are in need financially father for those who are struggling in their relationships I pray that you would visit with them and spend the time with them that they need to realize that human beings are always going to fail us but you alone are sufficient and I pray Lord that you would work to break and to mend the brokenness in the relationships I pray, Father, that you would have your hand 
in the lives of the people that are present here today. Father, for all the various struggles that we face, for the, the challenges of life, for the health concerns that, uh, that are faced, Father, we just lift all of these up to you, knowing that you alone are capable, knowing that you alone have the answers. And Father, many times we don't know exactly what to say. Many times we are overwhelmed by the realities of life and we just, sometimes we feel like we just can't even speak. In those moments, we are reminded of the prayer that your son taught us, which we pray together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated as we continue to worship.
Amen. And you may be seated. And if our ushers will come forward at this time, we'll take our morning tithes and offerings. We pray for offerings this morning, though. Heavenly Father, we are thankful, Lord, for the church you've given us. And we're thankful for the money that you've supplied to us. And now as we give back a little, we ask that you bless the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. redeemed and the message in it is um, really powerful because it talks about um, those nights that we don't know how we're going to get through them when we go through those trials and those pains that we just think God why in the world would you let this happen to me and it talks about in those times he comes in and he redeems each and every one of them and you look back and you think oh that's how he got me through it so just um, listen and hopefully you'll be encouraged by it this morning Word, the coldest heart, the deepest wound, the endless dark, the lonely ache, the burning tears. 
times the bitter nights the wasted years life breaks and falls apart but we Thank you, ladies, for pulling that one together for me this week. The, uh, the reason that I asked them to sing this song, and it is a very powerful song, is because I think it lines up really well with the story that we're going to read this morning, or hear this morning, out of the book of Genesis. The, uh, the group Selah sings that song, and uh, they came and did a concert in McCook a couple of years ago when we were still there. And the, uh, the female singer from the group, that's a, a male and female lead, um, the female singer said that they had just finished recording that album. They were done. Finished. Done. And the, the, the guy singer got this song. And he emailed it over to her. He said, you've got to listen to this song. I think this would be a great song. And she emailed back, you're crazy. And I think she said that she let it set for three days before she listened to it because she was done in the studio. And after about three days, she listened to it. And then she said she cried for three hours. And then finally called him back and said, you're right. We've got to get that song on this album. 
The story that we're looking at this morning is a story that fits very well in our current culture. Because there's a whole lot of brokenness in our current culture. There's a whole lot of pain in our world. There's a whole lot of people in our world that are struggling with baggage from the past and with things that didn't go the way that they were supposed to go. Decisions that looked like they were sure wins that turned out to be absolute nightmares. Our world is full of hurting people. This morning we're looking at one of, one of the stories in the Old Testament that shows how God uses the pain that we go through to accomplish His purposes. And that is the story of Joseph. Now, you remember last week we talked about Joseph's father, Jacob. Joseph's father, Jacob, to sum it up, was a fink. He was a conniving, lying, stealing, arrogant man. And he raised 12 sons who looked an awful lot like him. We see in the early stories of Jacob's children that they're always getting in trouble. Sometimes they get into really bad trouble. Sometimes they do really messed up things. Now Joseph's role in the family was not necessarily that of troublemaker. His role in the family was that of tattletale. His role in the family was that of I'm the favorite and I'm going to make sure I stay the favorite by making everybody else look bad. And so as the story of Joseph starts to emerge, we see that Joseph was his father's favorite. His older brothers were out in the fields doing things that they shouldn't have and we don't know exactly what those are. But Joseph came home and told dad and the boys got in trouble. Now I say boys, but the truth is that Joseph is 17 when this is going on, and he's the youngest. Do the math, and we're talking about 20s, 30s, even 40-year-old brothers. One of his brothers in this time is ready for grandkids, so if that gives you any indication of the age, Joseph is the tattletale. Joseph is also a dreamer. He has these dreams, and in the first dream that he had, he was out in the fields with his brother actually doing work, which he doesn't seem to do a whole lot of. He's always at home with dad while the boys are out working in the fields, but this time in the dream he was actually working, and they were binding together sheaves of grain, and their sheaves bowed down to his sheaves. Now, I don't know what you would think if that happened to you, but the older brothers were already mad enough at this little fink. And that just really fueled their anger and their jealousy. Oh, to top it all off, Daddy loved him so much that he had this very, very fancy robe made. We can't tell exactly what it means. We've always translated in the King James as a robe of many colors. We don't know exactly what that means. We just know it was really beautiful, really fancy. It was the top of the line. And he wore it all the time. And he wore it to show his brothers who he was and who they weren't. I'm the favorite. Then Joseph had another dream. And in the dream there were 12 stars. And the other 11 stars bowed down to one star. And then the sun and the moon also bowed down to that one star. And he told his brothers and he practiced a little interpretation. He's like, you know what this means? This means that all you brothers are going to bow down before me. And so are mom and dad. They're the sun and the moon. Now, in case you're wondering, this did not set well with his brothers. It's not like they liked him to start with, but now they really hated it. Even dad got mad on this one. And dad said, are you a lunatic? You think I'm going to bow down before you? 
You may be spoiled, but you're still the son. One day, daddy decided to send Joseph out for a little work, if you call it that. The brothers had been gone for a while. He didn't know where they were. And he said, Joseph, will you go check on them for me? I think they were over around Shechem. So Joseph gets dressed up. Guess what he wears? That coat of many colors. So that they would see him coming from afar off and know, hey, there's the favorite. I don't know if he thought about this. You know, when I was growing up, I had the smart mouth and my brother was the bigger. He was older. And we rode the school bus and, and when we would ride the school bus, it was a 45 minute ride because we lived way out in the boondocks. And all the way home from school, I would humiliate him and smart off and make him look really bad in front of his friends. But then every day as we came past the Millport grocery store, I started to realize we're almost home. And mom and dad aren't. And so I started, every time we'd stop, I'd move up a couple of seats so that I could get to the front of the bus so that as soon as the bus stopped, I could take off, hopefully get inside, unlock the door, uh, and get in the bathroom and lock the bathroom door and wait there till mom and dad got home. Because there were consequences. He was bigger than I was. He was stronger than I was. And he found great joy in thumping me. Just as I found great joy in telling stories and making him look foolish. I don't know if Joseph had ever thought about the reality that there's 11 of them, and there's one of him, and daddy's not going to be anywhere around sometime. Joseph goes over to Shechem, and the brothers aren't there. Someone says, I think they were going over to Dothan, and so Joseph follows them. And they see him before he sees them. And they say, oh, there's the dreamer. Let's kill him. Now, they weren't joking when they said, let's kill him. When my brother would threaten me and say, I'm going to kill you when we get home, I knew I was going to be in pain, but I knew it wasn't going to be death. They said, let's kill him. And so they started planning. They decided they didn't really want to be violent with him. They were just going to throw him in a cistern and let him die. Reuben convinced them of that plan rather than, you know, having that blood on their hands. Just, oops, he fell with a little help. Let him die there. We don't know exactly where Reuben was, but the other brothers saw a caravan of slave traders coming through and they said, hey, we got a better idea. Rather than just letting him starve to death, might as well make some money off of it. So they sold Joseph into slavery. And they took his robe of many colors. They didn't let him wear that as a slave. They took that home. But first they killed a goat and they dipped his, his coat in the goat's blood so that when they got home they said, Dad, we found this out on the plains. Something must have happened to Joseph. Do you think this is his? And Joseph is an absolute wreck because this was his favorite son. The brothers would try to comfort their dad and say, you know what, dad, it's okay, you still got 11. And he would say, no, I don't. Only one mattered. I'm going to go to my grave, a grieving father. You know, I'm guessing that these sons had a thought in their mind. That with Joseph out of the picture, they would be more special. I don't think they realized how demented their father was, how selfish their father was, and that with Joseph out of the picture, Joseph wasn't out of the picture. And they still were not loved like they longed to be loved. So Joseph is now being transported by slave traders. He ends up in Egypt and is purchased by a man named Potiphar who is 
the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. Now, I don't know if it was just because Joseph spent all of his time watching his brothers work, but he had a pretty good handle on how to get people to do what needed to be done. And he was very quickly promoted to being in charge of Potiphar's household. He was the top slave. He took care of everything, made sure everybody did their job, made sure everything got done. Potiphar was a very happy man. I'm guessing that Joseph kind of carried himself proudly again. You know, after you've been sold into slavery, you might hunker down and be sorry for yourself for a while. But then I'm guessing that he started puffing up and carrying himself kind of proudly again. Look at what he was doing. Everywhere he went, everybody liked him. But somebody liked him too well. Potiphar's wife noticed this puffed up young man. Became very attracted to him and tried to seduce him. You know, sometimes you play those games, you try to get other people's attention until they actually pay attention, and then you're like, oh no, what do I do now? I think this was one of those games for Joseph. He had her attention, and he didn't want it, and he couldn't lose it. And she didn't like being told no. So one day, she was in the house alone, probably had sent all the other servants out. Joseph came in to check on something, and she grabbed him. And he said no, and he ran away. But he ran so quickly that he left his robe behind, whatever it was. This robe thing with Joseph keeps getting him in trouble, doesn't it? Well, she is embarrassed at this point, angry, and yells rape. Tells her husband that this Hebrew that you have brought in has humiliated me. She doesn't tell him really why he humiliated her. He, she fabricates a story. And he's angry and throws him in jail. Now he is the head of, or he's the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. It's interesting that he throws Joseph in jail rather than having him killed, which was the common way to handle people that made high people mad in that day, as we're going to find out in a minute. If somebody crosses you, you kill them. That's the way they handled it. That was their system. Maybe he knew his wife. Maybe he suspected that she was telling a tale, and in his anger, he took it out on Joseph, but he recognized that there may be some truth, and he didn't want to punish Joseph. We don't know. But Joseph sat in jail for two years. A dark, dismal cell. But good old Joseph, everywhere he goes, everybody likes him, even in prison. And so he soon takes over the responsibilities of the prison to where the prison guard's in charge, but not really, because Joseph takes care of everything. A couple years later, a a couple of uh, Pharaoh's direct servants are thrown in prison. One is the the chief cupbearer, the other one is a baker. They both got on Pharaoh's bad side. I don't know if the you know, the wine was warm and the, the pastries were cold or what it was, but they both got on Pharaoh's bad side at the same time. They're thrown in jail and they have dreams that are troubling them. They're sitting talking about their dreams, how troubling they are, and Joseph overhears them talking and says, well, tell me your dreams. So they tell him their dreams, the Joseph gives them an interpretation of their dreams, and that interpretation comes true. For the cupbearer, he has returned to his place of glory within three days, as Joseph predicted. For the baker, not so good. He ends up being killed three days later, just as Joseph described. Joseph tells the cupbearer, and he doesn't say anything to the baker about it, but he says the cupbearer, When you get out of here, remember me. 
I was kidnapped from my homeland. He wasn't really. He was actually sold by his brothers. But kidnapping sounds better. And I'm in this prison, and I didn't do anything to deserve it. Would you please try to get me out of here? And the cupbearer said, of course I will, and then forgot it immediately. Until two years later. Two years later, Joseph is, or Pharaoh has two dreams in the middle of the night that are troubling him. They trouble him so much that he calls in all the magicians in the kingdom, all the smart people, and he says, tell me what my dreams mean. And they all look at him and say, we don't know. We don't have a clue. And just as Pharaoh was probably ready to get angry and do something crazy to these people who don't know how to do their jobs, the cupbearer is there with Pharaoh and he said, I know somebody. And I have done a great misservice because I forgot to tell you this guy's story and tell you that he needed to come out of prison two years ago. But here's the story. So he tells them how this guy interpreted the dreams for the baker and the cupbearer. It came through exactly as as Joseph had told them. Pharaoh said, well, get him up here. And so they clean him up, shave him, give him a fresh robe that keeps coming up. And he comes before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, I hear you can help me. And he said, well, I can't personally, but God does. God can. Tell me your dream. So Pharaoh tells him the two dreams. In the first dream, seven beautiful, wonderful looking cows are drinking beside the Nile River, and seven ugly, skinny, scrawny cows come up and eat them, but you can't tell that they have eaten them because they're still just as scrawny as they were before. The second dream was seven plump uh, heads of grain were waving in the wind, and all of a sudden seven scrawny heads of grain came up and ate them. And again, they didn't look like they'd eaten anything. They were still as scrawny as they were before. And Joseph told Pharaoh, here's the deal. The land of Egypt is getting ready to have seven beautiful, wonderful years of plenty in their harvests. It's going to be the best years you've ever had. But following those seven years, you're going to have seven of the most difficult years of famine that you've ever had. The fact that you've had this dream twice says that God wants you to know so that you can prepare And you would do well to hire someone during the seven years who could take care of the plenty and set it aside so that when the seven years of famine come, there's enough for your entire kingdom to stay alive. Pharaoh looks at the others in the room and he tells them something. And I want us to read this verse. Chapter 41 starting in verse 37. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, remember these are the ones who could not interpret the dream, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Well, where'd that come from? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court, and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a higher rank than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then he removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's fingers. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. 
He had J- Joseph ride around in the chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, Kneel down. So Joseph put, or so Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Joseph was 30 years old when this happens. 30 years old, second in command in the most powerful nation in the world. An hour earlier, he was the head of this prison. Well, not really the head. He was under the warden of the prison because he was a prisoner himself. And within an hour, he goes from being a prisoner to being second in command. But what I find so interesting is that what Pharaoh saw in Joseph was not that Joseph was such a wise man who had all the answers. But he said, you are obviously filled with the, Holy, with the Spirit of God. Now part of the reason that this is such a challenge is because in the Egyptian culture, Pharaoh was the one who was supposed to hear and be able to understand the will of the gods. In the Egyptian religious order, Pharaoh was the head of the priests, and he alone had communication with the gods. And so when this young man came along, it rocked Pharaoh's world a little bit, because he did not clearly hear from God the way that this young man heard from God. But what I want us to look at this morning is not just the amazingness of this transition from being a prisoner to being second in command, but I want us to look at the process of how that could have happened. In our culture today, we believe that people should be able to rise through the ranks very quickly and never have to work for it. One of the greatest challenges that's facing corporate America is the lack of employees among the younger generations. The younger generations don't understand that you have to work your way up. The younger generations think, well, I've got a college education. I should be able to start right next to the CEO. And they'll take a job in the mailroom thinking that they can work their way up, but if it doesn't happen within six months, they get mad and quit and go back home to mom. This is taking place all across corporate America, and then there's a lot of research going on of how can we fix this, because we are missing a generation of workers because they won't work. They won't recognize that not everybody gets to be CEO. In America, we think everything has to be given to us easily. But when we look at this story and we realize that Joseph did go from the bottom to the top in rather short order, it really wasn't that short of an order. This process had been going on for several years. It was a process where God broke Joseph so that Joseph could be useful. The title of my message this morning is Transformation. But transformation only happens through brokenness. We've looked at the story of Jacob. We've realized that his brother or his sons were following in their father's footsteps. They were selfish, selfish, selfish. We've looked at the story of Joseph and how his brokenness was redeemed. He went through a lot of painful stuff, but you gotta admit, having the nice Mercedes Benz at the end makes up for it, doesn't it? I mean the chariot with people, because even if you drive a Mercedes Benz today, people don't run around in front of you saying, kneel down, kneel down. That was a pretty, pretty nice perk to the job. Brokenness 
difficulties, trials, pains, whatever you call it, got Joseph's attention. Through brokenness, God got a hold of Mr. Arrogant Joseph and told him, it's not all about you. Because Joseph certainly thought it was. Why else would you be dressed up to the nines when you're walking across the desert to go and check on your brothers? You know, most people put on their work clothes for that. Brokenness got Joseph's attention. Brokenness encouraged his faith. Through the trials that Joseph experienced, he came face to face with the reality that even as smooth of a talker as he was, he couldn't take care of it on his own. He had to believe in the God that his father talked about, but that his grandfather had shared intimately about. Joseph came face to face with the reality that faith is a lot more than talk. We can say that we have faith. And it's easy for us sitting here on Sunday morning to say, we've got faith. But if somebody walks in the back door with a gun and starts waving it around and says, I'm going to shoot anybody that claims to believe in God, now all of a sudden that faith Doesn't seem so easy, does it? Faith doesn't really show up until you face a difficulty. Because we say all kinds of things, don't we? Our culture is full of saying this and actually doing this. Well, Jacob was that way too, you know. He said, hey Esau, I'll meet you over here in Sierra. And he goes over to Shechem. Tell you one thing, but I really believe another. But when you've been sold into slavery and you've lost your favorite code and you've lost everything you know, you have no idea where you're going and Facebook can't help you reconnect with your family after 50 years, brokenness encouraged Joseph to develop faith that he would not have any other way developed. Brokenness encourages authenticity. It's easy for Joseph to put on the mask of saying, I'm the favorite son. But when you're a slave, goodbye masks. Brokenness encourages transformation. Joseph was transformed in this time period. Not because... He figured it all out on his own. But because he was broken to the point that he couldn't figure it all out on his own. What is transformation? Transformation in the sense in the church is being transformed into the image of God. Being who God wants us to be rather than being who we are naturally inclined to being on our own. Quite honestly, as nice as many of us are, we're all still very selfish. Jacob wasn't unique in his selfishness, and his sons were not unique in their selfishness. But transformation is the process where we go from being selfish to being who God wants us to be. God's purposes are not the same as our purposes, though. Our purposes, we are looking for comfort, convenience, happiness, and a better quality of life now. I don't know if you caught it on the Super Bowl ads. That's what every one of them was trying to sell you. If you buy our product, your quality of life is better now. You are happy now. This product is more convenient than that other product. Well, the truth is you didn't need either one of them, but because this one's more convenient, you buy it. Or comfort. It's got to be comfortable for me. That's what it's all about. 
But that's not God's purposes. God's purposes are relationship with His creation. He created us to have a relationship with us. He really doesn't care if our car has heated leather seats, if we don't know who He is. He has a redemptive relationship between His creation, and and He wants us to have redemptive relationships with each other. Can I tell you something? Human beings are going to offend one another. I said this two years ago when I came. I'm sure that I will, within short order, offend most of you. Never intentionally, but I will. And the truth is, many of you can offend me too, because we're all human. That happens. But God's desire is that we not allow that offense to really destroy us, but we recognize that we can use those offenses to work through and come up with a better way. God has in mind missional living by His creation. That's big church words that says, you live like you care. You live to make a difference in your world, not just to be comfortable and satisfied. You live as if Jesus' death means something. And God's purposes, God's design is that we would bless the world so that all the people look to Him. Not us, but to Him. I want us to go back a couple of weeks to God's promise to Abraham. He told Abraham, and he told him this several times, he told Isaac this, he told Jacob this, Jacob just didn't get it. First thing I want you to do is sacrifice. He told Abraham, I want you to leave everything. And then he said, I want you to obey, I want you to follow me and go to the land that I will show you. And then he said, I want, I'm going to give you blessings. You are going to have an abundance. And out of that abundance, I want you to be a blessing. Through you, all of the nations of the world will be blessed. We sacrifice, we obey, we receive blessings, and we are a blessing to others. That was Abraham's promise. That was Isaac's promise. That was Jacob's promise. That was Joseph's life. He sacrificed by losing his family. He lost everything, just as Abraham had, actually more so because Abraham brought his immediate family with him. Joseph sacrificed. Joseph was obedient, even when it was hard and even when he was falsely accused. Think about this. Joseph, when when Potiphar's wife is pursuing him, is somewhere in his 20s. And in his 20s, he has hormones that rage. And here is most likely an attractive woman if she's married to that per, uh, that high of a person in their system. He had to obey even when it was hard. The easy thing to do would have been just to say, oh, okay. Obedience, even when it's hard and even when you are falsely accused. Blessings. Joseph becomes the second most powerful person in the most powerful kingdom on the earth at that time. Like I said, he had it better than a Mercedes. That's quite the blessings. But his blessings were not for himself. I don't know if you think through this, if you ever thought through this. Through Joseph, the known world was saved from starvation. If Joseph had not come onto the scene, interpreted the dream for Pharaoh, oversaw the development of these storage cities and the disbursement of these store, these grains after the, the famine started, the known world would have starved to death. You know what a famine is? Nothing grows. Nothing grows. There is no food. Livestock die. And unless you're prepared for it, then you die. In those days, there was no United Nations to oversee the delivery of food. In those days, they weren't going to come on TV halfway around the world and with the the ads of the starving children and say, please, 
In those days when you were dying, you were dying. There's nothing that could be done about it. If it were not for Joseph, the known world of that time, and seven years is long enough that even the wealthy would have been done in. Through Joseph, all the kingdoms of the world at that time were saved. But you see, Joseph couldn't have been there if Joseph had not been transformed. Joseph could not have been useful in this position if God did not transform him to make him usable so that he could hear from God and have wisdom to interpret dreams. When Joseph comes out of that prison cell, he does not say, yeah, I got you covered. I can take care of you, what you want, and let me tell you up front what I want out of it. Joseph says, I can't do anything, but God can give you the answer that you need. Transformation is God's desire. So we sacrifice. We're called on to sacrifice. Life is not always easy. Life is not designed to be easy. The American dream is a lie. That's not what it's all about. We build character and we learn who God is when we obey. Not just by reading a 20-minute devotional and then going out and living as if we hadn't. We learn and we build character, we learn who God is through obedience. And we are blessed. And we are blessed beyond any of our physical stuff, any of the stuff that got us here this morning, or any of the stuff we're going back home to, or any of the stuff that we have here at this building. We are blessed because we have the opportunity to experience an intimate relationship with God that sustains us no matter what else we face. Because no matter how much stuff you accumulate, it will all fail you. No matter how many friends you think you have, they will all fail you. But the intimate relationship with Jesus Christ is the only thing that can sustain you. The only thing that can give you purpose and meaning. The only thing that matters, both now and for all eternity. But we're not just blessed so that we can sit back and say, wow, God loves me. We are blessed so that we can look at others and say, God loved me, and He loves you too. And if He can love me, then He can definitely love you. We are blessed so that we can be a blessing. His desire is our transformation. That we would be transformed from selfish to caring. And not just caring about us, but caring about the things that really matter. So the question that I have for us today is, are we ready to embrace transformation? Even when it costs us. I'm going to do something this morning I don't normally do, and, and if the worship team could come back up, I'm going to ask that they sing Unredeemed again. And as they sing Unredeemed, I'm going to open up our altars. And if there are things in your life that you have been wrestling with, if God is speaking to you and saying, I really want to use you, I really want to do things through you, stop fighting me. If you are experiencing brokenness and you don't know what to do and you just want to say, God, I don't know what to do, but I bring it to you. Then I want you to come forward. And I want you to pray and just allow God, give Him permission to transform you. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy to make the step to come up here. And it's not going to be easy when you walk out the door. But it's the work that He wants to do in us. And you know, as I think about this story, what would life have been like if Joseph would have acted like his daddy? As we continue this story, and you'll read it this week, but I want you to pay attention to some things. 
Jacob gets mad when his brothers come back and say that their younger brother has to go with him. He explains, you are robbing me of my children. They are his children. Now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is going against me. They tell him the story of what happened and said, why were you so cruel to me? Why did you even tell them that I had another brother? Or that you had another brother? You see, Jacob just continued his entire life to view things selfishly. Can I tell you that his sons didn't want to be around him because he was always blaming them for everything? He wouldn't accept blame for anything? Are you willing to open yourself up to transformation and be the person that God can use rather than being the person that no one wants to be around? What does God want to do through your life? I don't know. But I know that He has a plan for each one of us. And that the pain that we have endured, even though many, much of the pain was our own choosing, the pain that we have endured, He will use in our lives to reach others for Him. So I'm going to ask that you stand as they sing through this song. And if you feel led to come forward and pray, then I would encourage you to do so. Let's stand together. The cruelest word, the coldest heart, deepest wound, the endless dark, the lonely ache, the burning tears, the bitter nights, the wasted years, life breaks and falls apart. But we Oh, the me- 
going to ask that we go ahead and do white flag as well after I, after I pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that even when we mess up, you can still and will still redeem. And thank you very much, Lord, that you did not create life with the end, purpose of, end goal of being perfect and never making mistakes, but you created life with the intention that we would be usable for you and have a relationship with you, which each of us can experience. Lord, I thank you that you give us the example of Joseph. As hard as it is, you give us the example. That nothing is too far gone for you. And even though Joseph must have thought that he was too far gone, even though Joseph must have thought that it just doesn't make sense, it, it just won't work, you worked in a way that only you could. You worked not because Joseph figured it out on his own, but because he waved the white flag and said, God, whatever you want to do, I'm game. I will not curse you, I will not sin against you, even when things don't go my way. Father, I pray that you will help us to live that way as well. May we wave the white flag in our life and not be so consumed with being right or with winning the wrestling match with you, but may we wave the white flag and say, God, may your will be done in our lives so that your will can be done in the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to go ahead and sing through White Flag. The altars are still open if you want to come forward. Or if not, uh, we'll sing through this song and then we will be dismissed. The battle rages on As storm and tempest roar Cannot win this fight inside a rebel.
as you go, look at the trials that you're facing, recognizing that it's not all bad, that God can use these things. He does use these things to accomplish His purposes. And look at them through His eyes. Because He's got great plans for each one of us to accomplish, to bring others to Him. Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, may we, like Joseph, have the attitude of openness to You. And may we be useful for Your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed.